weekend. Don't you guys have any way to go on a long weekend? I mean, really? <laughs> now you're sitting in church on a long weekend. I thought everybody's gone on holiday and took a break. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm really blessed that you are so serious about coming to church on a long weekend. I, I honestly, I said to my wife, we expect not too many people this morning, but my goodness, because we went away for three days, but we came back yesterday. We took a, few, a quick break with our grandchildren, uh, the two of us with the grandkids, and uh, I, I believe that they said it would be fun. It was tiring. It was very tiring, but it was awesome. It was great, and we are back here, and we are back in one piece, happy to be part of what God is doing. So uh, if you are with us for the very first time this morning, you received a black cup with a cappuccino inside of it, and the rest of us are a bit envious of you, but please make sure that you are... Uh, you go there to brag with your, with your cup so people can greet you and find out who you are and make sure that you are, you are welcome. We appreciate the fact that you are here this morning. Also, our online people, thank you for joining us this morning. We are continuing with building your life. You will see it says on the bottom there, where is it? I don't know where it is. It will come up there, part two. Um, but I told you last Sunday we're going to do building your life part one and part two. But now it has grown to part three. And I'm going to continue next Sunday because there's just so much more I need to share with you on this subject. So sorry, Hannah, you're going to have to come back next Sunday again. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's, he's, he's relocating and he said he's so happy he's here for two weeks to catch this one. But you can watch online from, from Poch, no problem. Um, so, so let me just recap. Who was not here last Sunday? Just raise your hand quickly. Not here. Not. Come on. Don't feel shy. No, not yet. It's fine. Good, okay, there's quite a bit of people who are not here. It's, it's kind of general practice that people don't attend every Sunday, but they kind of every second or every third Sunday, which is no problem. We're happy that you are here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to recap like only five minutes into last week weekly, 10 minutes max, and then I'm going to come back to where I'm at so that you at least know where we and what we are talking about. So we are talking about building your life. And if you want to build the life that God has in store for you, you're going to have to work with God. It's not everything God's responsibility and I do nothing. I have to work with God to build the life that God has in store for me. Because we know that God says, I have plans for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and to give you a hope. But I need to tap in with what God wants for my life and then start working in that direction that He has for my life. Now, if I can just say it very quickly, I'm going to speak very quickly and then I'm going to slow down when I get into today. I'm still at next, last Sunday now. Uh, I said last Sunday that there's two groups of people, probably in this building as well, as we start serving the Lord. You have givers and you have takers. You have uh, contributors and consumers. You have people that are uh, uh, wilderness Christians and others that are promised land Christians. We have different mindsets. And I remember a number, maybe a decade, a bit more than a decade ago, I was challenged with the, with the mindset that I, have, that I had. And I didn't realize I had the mindset. Because the truth of the matter is you don't know what you don't know. You have to get that one. You don't know what you don't know until you learn what you didn't know. Then you know what you didn't know. Did you get that one? Now you don't know at all. It's a fact. There's a lot of things in God's kingdom, and I've been serving Him for many years, that I did not know until I was challenged with my way of thinking about certain things. And when I was challenged with the way of certain things, in the beginning, I hit heels in. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't like what, you, what I'm hearing here, what I'm reading here, what somebody's telling me. Because I started rubbing shoulders with people that think a bit different than I did at that stage. And I thank God today for people that can challenge our thinking. Because I cannot remain where I was 20 years ago. We all need to grow because we acquire new knowledge, new things we didn't know about God, about His kingdom. And then we need to move forward in life. And we need to grow. If we don't grow, if we still say we're exactly where we were 20 years ago, it means we didn't grow at all. And God wants us to grow. So... So all of us start out as takers. When you're a baby, everything must be done for you. Your diapers must be changed, you must get the bottle, you must get, everything must be done. Spiritually, it's exactly the same. When we are born again, we, everything must be done for us. We must be taught, we must be given, we must receive everything. But then at some stage, we need to grow to the next level of, instead of being a taker, to say, Lord, I want to become a giver. Because everybody who is a taker, listen to this, everybody who is a taker and you are happy, happy to receive things, you must receive it from God but through somebody. God always looks for somebody who says, yes, Lord, I want to be a giver. 
Then God will look for somebody. I will put up my hand. You put up your hand. You, Lord, I want to be a giver. I want to be a contributor to the kingdom. And the moment we do that, God says, okay, I'm choosing you to work through you because that guy is praying for a breakthrough. That guy is praying for a miracle. But I want you to see something here this morning. I didn't say this last Sunday. I only got this thing this week. If I... If we are at the place that we all start off with is where I say, Lord, I really need a breakthrough in my life. God, I need a breakthrough. I need you to supply this and this and this. Listen to this. That requires faith. Because you must trust God. It requires faith. Then what God must do is he must look for somebody who is who's prepared to, to say, okay, I want you to help me to fulfill the need of that guy who's got faith for his breakthrough, for his miracle, for his supply. Maybe there's no money, there's no food, there's no whatever. God raises up. This guy doesn't need faith. This guy needs obedience. You need to get this. And since obedience is better than sacrifice, to be obedient is better to have faith, to believe, to receive something. Because this, is in a, this takes way more of you. To be obedient to God and say, Lord, I want you to work through me instead of just working for me. Ah, you're missing it. Entry level is to be a recipient, to just always want God to supply my need for me. But when we move to the next level and say, Lord, I don't want you to only supply my need. Obviously you do, but I want you to work through me to be the answer to somebody else's prayer, to be the solution to somebody else's problem. I want to be that person. And my work this morning is to challenge you to desire to be that, to say, Lord, I can't just sit here. I need to be the one who works with you to let the miracles happen for people. Amen? Because that's where God wants us. We can't stay at the same place as just wanting to receive, wanting to receive. So, it, if, so obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better than just wanting God to supply my every need. I need to move to that, to that place. Can you please put on the screen for me the triangle that I had last week? I just need to explain this very quickly. I'm going to try and do it within a minute. Because that was last Sunday. The screen, there we go. I tried to explain this to you last Sunday because this is very important to understand this. Um, the scripture we used, first put the Romans, Romans uh, 12 verse 2 on the screen for me, please. Sorry, I forgot that one. Romans 12 verse 2. Just get that one on the screen. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed with a renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a good will, there's a perfect will, there's an acceptable will. We can decide how much I will let my mind be renewed so I can live in that perfect will of God because that's ultimately where we want to be, in God's perfect will. That's where we need to be. So we, the, 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 the bottom line is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind must be renewed. Last Sunday, I had three guys standing up here and I said to you, the one will be your thoughts, the other one will be your will. The other one will be your emotions. This whole thing about the, the trinity of the mind, I'm going to talk about that next Sunday in detail. This is going to be a very good teaching. Don't miss that next Sunday. That one. I'm going to, I don't have time for that one now. Put that one back on the screen for me quickly. C, U, C, C, S. C is your conscious mind. I explained that last Sunday. Your conscious mind is what you're using right now at this moment. You hear my voice. I speak to you. It goes into your ear. You see, see things. You are using your conscious mind to acquire knowledge. That's what you're doing at this very moment. Your unconscious mind is what you use to just do stuff which you have already mastered. Habits. To walk, to talk, to pick up a chair, to drive a car, to anything you do. Every single thing that you have mastered, every knowledge that you have. It came through your conscious mind. You, you learned the things through repetition. It went into your unconscious mind so you can just do them without thinking even. With me there. Then we said the third one here is your subconscious mind. That is where the renewal of the mind need to take place. Because your subconscious mind, listen to this, although the other no conscious mind and unconscious mind has got to do with knowledge that you acquire, and uh, then you repeat those things. The subconscious mind works very much on things that you have experienced, and you, you connect that to the emotion that you felt when you went through that thing. And since the day you've been born until this morning when you're sitting in this church, everything happened to you. Uh, things you've heard, things that were done to you, things that you've heard that were said to you, they went and they formed your subconscious mind, which is your belief system. Your belief system is what you believe because of everything that has happened with you until this very moment. 
If you were in an abusive relationship, maybe you're a woman in an abusive relationship, you might believe that all men are abusers. All men are bad. All men are untrustworthy. If you've been molested as a child by whoever, you might think all those kind of people are bad. If uh, you've been robbed with, cert with a certain person in business, for instance, uh, you might think all people like that are bad. That will become your belief system. And you will close doors to people around you. You will close doors because you don't want to be hurt again. Because your belief system, which is con connected to your subconscious mind, is very strongly connected to an emotion that you feel. And often, you will know what I'm talking about now, often it will happen with you. Somebody will say something, it will be in a conversation, maybe with your husband or your wife or your children or your parents. And somebody says something and something triggers in you. And you just lose it for that moment. You are just either start crying or you are cross. or, And then you have to step back and ask, where did that come from? What happened here? Why did that upset me so much? It's because in your subconscious mind, the bottom one, there is something that has not been dealt with. And that is the reason why we have to say, that part of us must be conformed. That must be changed. That must be made new. My belief system must be renewed. For instance, if you do not believe, if you do not believe that God wants to bless you, you will live as a person that believes that God wants to punish you. Every wrong thing you do, He's going to hit you. He's going to hit you. He's going to hit you. You will live a life of fear from, of God. But if you know that God is a loving God, God only wants the best for you, and you live from that perspective, you know it's not about everything you do wrong. It's not about that. I just feel I need to say this quickly. I'm completely off my, I need to explain this to somebody here. Because I feel in my spirit, somebody says, oh, you are, you are hammering yourself so much because of the things you don't get right. You keep on doing this thing over and over, and you think God hates you for it. God doesn't hate you. And I'm, I'm getting this picture of you teaching a baby how to walk. You're helping up, he gives three steps, bang, he falls down. Help him up again, three steps, fall down. You don't say, you stupid, worthless child. Nobody does that. You help the child. Next time you try again, and you try again, and a year later you can't even believe that that's where you started. It's exactly the same in our growth. Don't look short term, look long term. Don't hammer yourself with things that you're still struggling with. Look at where you come from so you can see where God has brought you from. And celebrate your wins. Ah, uh, you're not getting this, even man, just like it, man. <laughs> celebrate your wins. Celebrate the, good, the, the, the victories that you have. The devil will always try to push you down. He will always try to bring the, the things you do wrong in front of you. He will always do that. You might do 10 things right, but the one thing that you do wrong, he wants to lift that up. Oh, you call yourself a Christian, look at this. Yeah, I've learned long ago. It's not about my, how great I am, it's about how great he is. It's not about me being perfect. It's about I'm serving a perfect God. And I will never be perfect in this life. Never, never, never. Yeah, I will never be able to satisfy everybody in this life. I'm only going to try and live up to His expectation of me. And that's what we need to understand. We are not here to perform. We are not here to impress. We are simply here to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. That's it. I want to serve you, Lord. Help me to renew my mind so I can be more effective in God's kingdom. It's not about being better than anybody else. It's, not, it's only about being improving yourself. That is the race we run. We don't seem to impress other people about how great we are. No, no, we know we need Jesus. The moment He takes His hand away from us, we are nothing. The moment God removes His grace, we are nothing. We can only be in something because of His grace and His goodness. Okay, the first thing then we spoke about last Sunday is you need to take responsibility. If you want to say, I'm going to have my mind renewed, First thing, take responsibility of your life. Stop having excuses. You remember last week I said that David and Goliath, when, when uh, David showed up on the battlefield, everybody had equal opportunity to go and sort out Goliath, but they chose not to take the risk. David shows up 40 days into the battle. Nobody has taken on the giant, and he asks, why has nobody taken the giant? And they have all these lame excuses about the biggies and blah, 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 blah. But because he had a track record of God's faithfulness with the bear and the lion, he said, I will do this. I will do this. I will take him on. And he did that. Everybody had equal opportunity. But only one young man decided to step up to the platform. And it changed the outcome of that battle. 
You see, God is looking for somebody who's saying, Lord, I will stand up. I will trust you. I will believe you. I'm not going to look at the problem. I'm going to look at you, Lord God. And then God needs us to say, yes, I'm going to do it. That means taking responsibility. The biggest problem for us to challenge, to build our lives, is the word excuses. Just like every single one of those soldiers had an excuse why they cannot take Goliath. David came in and realized, well, excuse is not going to bring us anywhere. We need to fight the battle. And God is calling us to say, Lord, I'm going to rise up to the challenge to get these things in my life sorted out. It's not easy because the, everything in you will shout and say, stay in your lane. Do not move out of your comfort zone. Change is difficult, but it's necessary. It's necessary. So we need to take up the challenge. Do you know that if something is important to you, something is important to you, you will find a way to do it. But if it's not important for, to you, you will find an excuse not to do it. If it's important, you'll find a way. If it's not important, you'll find an excuse. It's just the way it is. <laughs> now, what I believe many of the problem is with many of us, and I've said this before in this church, is that negative self-talk. You talk about yourself in a very degrading way. You, I, I used to be like this. I'm not lying to you. When I used to be on this journey early in my life and I would, I would stumble about over something or I'll lose it or I'll do sin, I will be so mad at myself and I will insult me. I will have a meeting with me and I will tell me how stupid I am and how ridiculous I am, how pathetic I am. But I've re realized I am God's creation. And for me to insult me is, cre is insulting God because I'm God's creation. Ah, you fell off the truck there, I saw. <laughs> what you think about you is important. You must never be arrogant about who you are, ever, ever, because what we are and what we have is because of God's grace. But you need to be confident in how God made you different. And, and I've said this before in this church, when, when the, 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 the very thing that cost the Israelites the promised land the very first time was when they stood on the edge of the promised land, only two years out of slavery, only two years, 12 spies went into the land. You know this story. Ten came back and they said, we can't. These guys are big. Two of them said, we can. God opened the Red Sea. He supplied water. He's supplying manna. God is the God of miracles. We can do it. They said, no, we are like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so are we in the eyes of the giants. Depends on how you see you. Oh, man. How you see you will greatly be reflected in how you think others see you. You need to know that you are born again by the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus. You've been made a new creation. And you need to know that who you are in Christ. And when you know who you are, the, the amazing thing is that when, uh, when Joshua and Caleb, who said we can do it, listen to this. They said we can take the promised land with their words. We can. The other ten said we cannot. Do you know that the other ten got exactly what they said? They died in the wilderness. These two said we can. They took it. Because 38 years later, they crossed the Jordan. And they took the promised land. Because what you say with your words is extremely important. What you say is uh, what you get. So be very careful what you say. Uh, you probably heard this story. I love this one. Uh, many, many, many years ago, when Africa was still Africa. Um, there was a shoe company in, the, in America that sent uh, two of the salesmen to Africa. They said, let's see if we can expand into Africa. And they went into Central Africa, these two guys, the boat. It was before uh, it was the way it is today. And they came there and they started exploring if there's possibility to do business in Africa. They received two replies back at the head office in America, the one guy, uh, his reply was, nah, no business opportunity in Africa. Nobody wears shoes in Africa. The next guy's reply came, send as many shoes as possible. Nobody has shoes in Africa. Can you see the difference of perspective? One person sees it as a problem. The other one sees it as a challenge. And that's how we build our lives. 
We can either decide, no, this is a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, and I'd rather pull back into my little life. But if God has called you to evangelize, you need to step out there and evangelize. If you need to go pray for the sick at the hospital, get out there and go pray for the sick at the hospital. Be prepared to do what God has called you to do. Do not, do not look at the problem. Look at the, the challenge, the, the, the solution to the, to the problem. You see, my attitude is, uh, is what will get me there. The problem is with many people when they build their lives is, uh, you can just put the other main screen back on again for me on the screen, building your life. You see the, the challenge with, uh, with, with many people is that we are afraid that we are going to fail when we get out of the boat. When we want to walk on the water, we're afraid we're going to fail if we open another shop or I reach out and I preach the gospel or I pray for somebody. I remember so well after I came to Jesus, I became a new born-again believer. We were in a church setting like this, and the, the people that time had the habit. The guy who were Lesiba, who would do the MC, he would be the habit and just stand there and say, uh, Brother John, there, would you open in prayer for us, please? I've never prayed in front of people. And my goodness, he saw me. And he said, Brother Yanni, would you open in prayer for me? Like, what? Like, like me? I got the flight of my life, I'm telling you. I just stood there and I, I mumbled a prayer. I was so embarrassed. I left the church like this. Oh, yes, what are the people thinking about me? I was a new believer. I was so embarrassed. Next time, I was kind of preparing. He's going to ask me. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to pray that and I'm going to pray that. And then he doesn't ask me. <laughs> and then three weeks pass and then, Yannick, would you open and pray for Oh, man, I didn't prepare in my mind. And then I have this silly prayer again. And uh, unprepared. Same with my very first sermon that I've preached. Honestly, way long, long ago. The very first sermon that my pastor asked me to preach. I prepared. I was so ready for that sermon. And I preached my first sermon. And I thought I preached for half an hour. And when I was done, I thought, it's only 10 minutes. Oh my goodness. And, I'm... <laughs> and that was all the knowledge I had. 10 minutes worth of knowledge. What am I saying? If I decided then, I was so embarrassed, I'm never going to pray again. Or I'm never going to preach again. I would not be standing here today and preaching God's word to you this morning. Because sometimes we have setbacks. Sometimes we have embarrassments. Sometimes things go wrong. We just have to rise up and do it again. It's a skill. You have to grow in what God... Maybe you pray for somebody and, uh, and, and you think you have to pray for them. God sees, tells you pray for them. And you believe it's going to be a miracle. Something's going to happen. Then you pray for them and nothing happens. It happens. It, it's happened with me many times. But then I, well, it's not about me. It's about the person who has the need, them with God. I might be the person between them. And if I can't do the healing, it's not me. I cannot heal anybody. But God can heal. And if God decides to heal at that moment that I pray, the miracle happens. But if I decide I'm not going to do it, it means the miracle is not going to happen. Because I'm the problem. Can you see the problem? So we need to say, yes, Lord, I want to be available. I want you to use me. I want to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to step out in faith and be used by you. Do not let failure stop you from trying again. Almost anybody who, is, who has accomplished anything in life has had a lot of failures on the journey. You've done things, it didn't work yet. You try it again, it didn't work yet. You try it again, it, ah, then you get one right, and it works. There we got it. So, so, so don't give up when things don't work out. Wow. The principle of sowing and reaping. We've already kind of touched on this. The, the secular people call it the law of attraction. They say this with these words. They say this. Uh, something that you feel strongly about, you talk about, you, you, will, you will bring it about in your life. In our terms, it'll be sowing and reaping. If I sow words of something that I feel strongly about, I feel maybe strongly about whatever. I think about it. I feel about it. I, I kind of live it. Those things, I will bring them about in my life. I will attract them to my life because it's seed that I'm sowing continuously. Do you know if you are continuously talking about um, how bad things are? How bad the government is, about corruption, about racism, about unfair treatment, about if, the things that you talk about continuously will manifest in your life. Ah. The things that you feel strongly about. 
I, for instance, feel strongly about a multiracial church. That's what I feel strongly about. I never want to ever pastor a church that is one race ever in my life again. I said that. I've said it numerous times. I, that's why I feel that I attract this. Because I feel strongly about it. I speak about it. Wherever I come, I speak about it. That is, it's possible, not only possible, it is awesome to be a multicultural church like this. Give the Lord a hand for you guys, man. You are awesome. It's great. So the things that you feel strongly about, you will attract it to your life. And that's why we need to make sure what we speak, what words do we sow, because that's what we will attract to our lives. So building your life, you need to sow those things that you want to attract to your life. The second point I want to make is decide what you want. Decide what you want. The first one was you need to take responsibility. The second was decide what is it that you want in life. If you know God has called you to do something specific, maybe you know God has called you for a prophetic ministry, then you need to de- start sharpening your skill how to be in the prophetic ministry. He's called you to be, uh, you know Pastor Martin does a school of the word Yeah, The things he teaches is brilliant. And if you know that you need to hone your, your knowledge of the word, you should be in that class. You need to decide what you want and then act upon it. Learn the word. Get the word into your system so that you can grow and become everything that God have you, have, have, has for you. Decide what you want. Do you know if I, have to, if I have to walk up to you now? Are you still with me? If I have to ask you now, just, just imagine you and I have a discussion, and I just have to ask you, what is your life motto? Do, do you have a motto uh, in your life? My, my motto, for instance, in life, uh, it's, it's all over. It's uh, the choices you make is the life you live. I believe it. I live by it. The choices you make is the life you live. Does it mean only good things happen? No, a lot of bad things have happened. But when something bad happens, you have a choice. What are you going to do with what just happened? And then you move from there. Are you in an abusive relationship? What are you going to do with the situation? Are you going to continue in it? Or are you going to make a choice to get out of it? Hello? So the choices you make is the life that you live. Maybe it's not the perfect life, but it's the one you have because you've made a series of choices up to where you are today. It's exactly that. And some, maybe something didn't work out at your work because your boss was horrible and you had to resign or you were fired or whatever. That is something that happened. Now you need to make a choice. Will that make me bitter or better? Choose better, not bitter. And that's the direction your life will go. If you choose better, it will go in another direction. Choices we make is the life we live. So, if I ask you this, what is it that you want in life? Just think for a moment. What is it that you want? What do you want God to use you with and through? What is it? I'm going to give you a second to think about this. Because if there's one thing I want to challenge you today with is this. I want to challenge you to dream again. To dream again. Because that's what decision is. You decide, Lord, I want to dream again. Because you see so many people struggle because life is so hard. And life is so difficult. And so often we have forgot that it's a dream that God has for us. Because the plan that God has for you, the plan to prosper, it's a dream that God has for you. God has a dream for you. He has a dream for me. So when you and I can come to that place, Lord, I want to tap into that dream that you have for me. So, what is your dream? (laughs) What is your dream? I'm going to tell you a story now, which I love. I've told it before in this church. Maybe there's a lot of you who haven't heard this. This this guy, uh, Monty Roberts, he wrote this book about uh, the man who listens to horses. I I love this brilliant story. He wrote this book, and in this book he writes this. And he says, when he was at school, his teacher asked him to write an essay on what their dream is in life. And, and, and he wrote that one day he would like to have, a, have a, a farm, a horse ranch. And on this horse ranch, it must be like 5,000 acres or huge, massive. And, uh, and he wanted to breed, breed thoroughbred horses and in, export them into Europe and wherever. So, uh, so he was quite excited about his dream. So he got the essay back, and when the teacher came, he dished them out on, the, on everybody's table. He got his back, and there was a big F in red, right in the middle. And he was like, wow, that was a good story. 
So we asked the teacher, why an F? He said, no, it's a good story, but it's completely out of your reach. Because you live in a trailer park. Your dad is a laborer on a horse ranch. There is no way you will be able to have a horse ranch one, one day. So I would like you to re write it. I'll rewrite it, and then you bring it back. I will give you a better mark than if you go. Just, just tone it down. He went home and asked his dad. This is what the teacher said. His dad asked, what do you want, son? He said, this is what I want. He said, then you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. You're going to stick to your dream, or you're going to allow a teacher to, to dilute your dream to what suits him. He said, I'm going to stick to mine. He went back the next day. The teacher asked, oh, boy, did you, uh, did you write the, the essay over? He said, no, sir. I've decided you can keep your F. I will keep my dream. You see, people will try to, to diminish what God wants to do in your life. They will always try to drag you down. The beautiful story is that uh, many years later, this man who wrote the book, Monty Roberts, he had his ranch. He had exactly what he said he wanted. He was exporting horses to Europe. He was exactly what he said he wanted to be. And the beautiful thing is that same teacher was still a teacher. And he was bringing kids. I'm going to say something about teachers just now. <laughs> he was bringing kids to the horse ranch on excursions to show to them what a man with a dream can accomplish. And said, you don't listen to your teacher if he doesn't have a dream. Any teachers in the house? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Hallelujah. What am I saying? Do not let people kill your dreams that God has for you. Because God has dreams for you to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you a future and a hope. I want to give you uh, this two or three more things I need to give you. Number two was... Uh, Decide what you want. Dream again. That was it. Number three is there's power in asking. Many people don't get this. This one is so simple, but it is so powerful. So many people do not want to ask for help. Ask advice. Um, I, I must say, I probably have the gift of asking. If there's something like that, I don't know. I have no issue to ask if I don't know something. Honestly, if I don't understand or I don't know, I just ask. It's no embarrassment. I have learned that normally sitting in a class atmosphere, the, there's, there's about 80% of the people that don't have the answer, but nobody wants to ask. And the one guy will put up and say, I don't get that. Explain that again. <sighs> Everybody's happy. Somebody put up their hand because now we can all learn from it. Why are we embarrassed to ask? Tell me why. Does anybody know? You just said pride, did you? Who said pride? You said pride. It could be pride. It could be that, what will the people think if they know that I don't know? They're going to think I'm stupid. So we will rather remain stupid. So people can think we are not stupid. Or we can... <laughs> No, guys, come on. We must be prepared to ask when we don't know the answer, when we need solutions. I don't know if you know this. People who do well in life, 99% of them are totally happy to help other people. It is a fact. It's absolutely a fact. But so many people would never ask. I remember the day when I, uh, I don't know if you guys know Pastor Bert Pretorius. He's in Pretoria, massive church, thousands and thousands of members, many branches. I called him one day, a few years back. I called him. I said, Pastor Bert, this is Yannick Carlos. I run a church here in Polokwane. Can I drive through to Pretoria? I just want to sit with you for one hour. I just need to pick your brain, man. Please, I need some direction and advice. Because you see, the thing is that you need to take advice and direction from somebody who has grown further than you. I'm going to open another can of worms here now, but, but I don't really take advice from people. Just leave that one there. Okay. <laughs> Somebody, so, so I call him. Now, I mean, he's really, he's kind of a big guy. I'm kind of a piccanini here. And I call him. And he said to me, no, Yanni, man, one hour won't help at all, man. Come spend three days with me. 
Like, what? what? Did, did you say three days? Yeah, yeah, I meant three. Like three days. Yeah, yeah, three days. Go to every meeting with me. Sit in every prayer meeting. Go to everything that I do, except going to home with me. You don't have to go home with me. But how amazing was it that this man of God was prepared to give three days that I could spend with him? I saw how they did church, how they, how they ran from the one campus to the other campus. I saw this man of God would preach for 2,000 people in the morning with his heart pouring it out. And that same evening, he will go to a campus with only 30 students pouring his heart out, heart out again. And I said, wow, God, I want to follow what this guy's doing because it's not about how big the crowd is. It's, if he can do the same for 30 students than he does for 2,000 people in the morning, this guy's got something I want. Amen. So the point is this, be prepared to ask advice about your business, about the ministry, about anything. Um, just for instance, just the other day, I was, uh, we had a pastor's conference about a month ago and, uh, about our region. And in this conference, something was discussed about the constitution of the church. And uh, there was something that I did not know. And uh, the, the, the previous moderator that we had, he was sitting there and he discussed, he explained the thing. I was sitting on the other side of the room, and I put up my hand and I say, uh, sorry, Pastor, where is that in the Constitution? I just want to make a note, because I want to follow up on that. Another pastor mocks me, my friend. He says, ha, you're the third deputy moderator, you don't know that. And I just look at him like this. And then I had the last session to talk. Uh, <laughs> so I had the last session where I was a speaker. So I used this point that I'm sharing with you now, asking, and I came back to this point, and I said to this pastor who said to me, you should have known this, and I said to him, when you, uh, when you mocked me, I'm okay with that because you're my friend, we are really good friends, when I said to him, I have no problem asking when I don't know, the good thing is now you also know the answer, because I know that you did not know the answer, <laughs> and uh, that is the truth. Don't be afraid to ask help, ask advice, ask somebody about scripture. Just the other day, Pastor Martin and I spoke about something, and he brought up a scripture, and he mentioned that scripture, and I thought, wow, I haven't seen that scripture in that way before. And it was so fresh, it was so nice, it was so awesome, that I could understand something that he knew that I did not know. There's no, there's no um, uh, embarrassment, there's no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no shame in asking. If you don't know, ask. It's as simple as that. Why don't we want to ask? We're afraid the answer will be no. Let, let me just use this as an example. Imagine I've called Pastor Bert, and I said, can I spend an hour with you? He said, no, you can't. Just imagine he said no. Did I lose something? No, because I didn't have an appointment before I've asked him. If he said no, I still did not have an appointment. But he said, yes, everything changed. Hello? Do not be embarrassed when the answer is no. If the answer is no, don't feel rejected. You're exactly where you were just before you asked. It was no. You had a no before you started. And then the second last point I want to make this morning is this. Boundaries. If you want to build your life, this, this one is absolutely vital. You have to have boundaries in your life. You have to say no to certain things so that you can say yes to the right things. Have you got this? You have to say no to certain people so you can say right, yes, to the things that's really needed. In my beginning years, I used to run after every phone call. After everybody that needed the pastor, I would jump in my car and go to them. Realizing I'm being held up so busy with so many things, with people that refuse to sort out their own lives, and I must come and run and, 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 and knock the fires down. Pa, pa, pa. And when I'm busy knocking this one, that one pops up again. I go there and this one starts his own fire again. Goodness, I told you not to start the fire. Now you do it again. Yeah, but you're the pastor. You must come with a fire extinguisher. But I've become way more effective when I started living according to my boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. The power to say no to certain, certain things so that you can say yes to the important things. Hello? Amen. Nehemiah, Nehemiah understood this principle. You still with me? Stay focused. Another 10 minutes to go. 
Nehemiah understood the principle when he was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And those guys, Sanballat and Tobias, were trying to stop the work. And they will send letters to him and say, come down to us. They were trying to distract him from his vision. He would ignore them, ignore them, ignore them, until he decided to reply to them. And he replied this, and he said to them, I am busy with a great work, and I do not have time for what you want to see me for. And he carried on building the wall. You see, the thing is, many people will want to distract you from living out the calling that God has on your life. It's a fact. God has a call on your life, and many will want to distract you, not because they don't like you, it's just who they are. They, they need you, but you have to draw the line to say, I'm going to put up boundaries. And the very last point is, uh, it's not on the screen. It's just, and I've said this many times, the people that we, that we mingle with, the people who we have in our lives, will greatly determine the direction my life go. So it's important who you marry. I'm serious. I am so serious. If you are 30 years old, not married, rather stay unmarried than marrying the wrong person. What? Absolutely. If you are 45, not married yet. Anybody in the house? Um, <laughs> ra <laughs> rather remain unmarried before you marry the wrong person. I'm not lying. The person who you have in your inner circle in your life will greatly determine the direction that your life is going to go. So the people, the friends, the people that you mix with, the people that you, that you rub shoulders with will greatly influence your life. They are saying, so if you are not influencing somebody else, they are influencing you. That's a fact. You can either influence somebody in a certain direction or they can push you in another direction. That's why it's vital for you to spend time with people that has vision that want to do God's will in their life, that want to do something with their life, to say, Lord, I want you to use me and work and walk with those people who want to accomplish something, who has a dream, to want to accomplish something and allow God's dream for their life to come into fulfillment. Tap in with visionaries, people who want to, who want to move forward in life. If you want to move forward, you have to tap in with those, the energy those people have, the passion that they have to do something great with their life. Amen. Don't let the devil tell you that you cannot. Henry Ford said, the guy who says it can be done and the guy who says it cannot be done are both right. Because if you say it cannot be done, then you are like the ten spies. If you say it can be done, you are like the two spies. You will get what you say. Because there's power in our words. And when we release those words, our minds are renewed on a regular basis. So now, that was the end of building your life part two. Next week, I'm going to talk about what happens up here. Uh, so we can, we can decide to renew our minds the way that God wants us to do that. Would you want to step out in faith and say to God, yes, Lord, I'm going to actively, listen to this, I'm going to actively renew my mind. Actively. Not say, yeah, I've heard a sermon now. Next week, I'll catch up next. No, no. Actively get into God's word. Listen to this again. Hear the word. Apply the word. Grow in the word. That is how we renew our mind. That is how we build our lives brick upon brick, layer upon layer. That's how we do it. Amen? Amen. Did you get the word? Amen. I realize it seems like it was 10 minutes too long because the, the guys in that corner is falling asleep and those guys on that side are chewing bubble gum. I'm joking. I'm, I'm, it's not true. It's not true. It's not true. Hallelujah. You know, really in closing now, the responsibility for growth, your growth, is not mine. It's yours. The responsibility for growth as a woman is not your husband's responsibility or your wife's or your parents'. It's your responsibility to grow your life according to God's will. So let us take that responsibility. Amen? Amen? Good. Can somebody remember what was the first point we made? Take responsibility. The second one? Decide what you want. The third one, ma'am? The what?
Exactly. And the fourth one? I quite hear what you're saying. I'm going to have to start over again. Let me, let me just do this sermon again. If there's one thing you must remember of today is decide to dream again. Listen to me. Decide to dream again. The devil wants to kill your dream. You have a dream to sing. You have a dream to worship. You have a dream to, to do stuff with your life. 12 o'clock today, we will have a funeral in this church. There's a lady who sits right at the back there, Aisha. She's not here today. Her husband passed away this week, Wednesday. Massive heart attack, boom. Only 58 years old. He still had dreams, but he's gone. We're having a funeral at 12 o'clock in this church today. What am I saying to you? Do not allow things to stop your dream. We don't know how long we have. My life starts here. I have no idea when my life is going to end. Make sure that we move in the direction that God wants me to move in. Don't waste time with trivial things that means nothing in the long run. Don't get bogged down with stuff that are not important to accomplish the dream that God has for you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask God to rekindle the dream in your heart again. To say, yes, Lord, I want you to, to revive the dream. Because maybe because of hurt and maybe because of disappointment, maybe because things didn't work out, maybe because of something that somebody said, you gave up on the dream. But I want to ask you this morning to say, Lord, just, just light that fire on the inside again. I want to dream again. I want to dream again. Let us pray about that. Father God, we thank you this morning that you have called us to be like Joseph, to be a dreamer, to have dreams, to have plans, to work with you, to let the dreams come to pass. And therefore this morning, Father God, my prayer is that every person in this house, if there's somebody in this house this morning that have not tapped into you, we pray right now, Lord, that they will do that. Asking you, Lord Jesus, to just come into our hearts, into our lives, and just come and take your place in my life, in our lives, in Jesus' name. And from this day on, Father God, we ask that your dream will become our dream. That your dream will become my dream. Your heart will become my heart. So that we can live according to what you're calling for us, is Father God. And Lord, if there's anybody in this house this morning that feel that I have given up on my dream. I have had setbacks. I've had people saying things about me that I cannot do it. But we decide today, no ways, we're going to rise up. We decide today... We're going to stand up. We, give, but we will become what God wants us to become. We're going to say to people, you can keep the F. We're going to keep the dream. Because that's what you want for us, Father God. And I pray that you will raise up men and women here today, this morning, that will become evangelists, prayer warriors, people who step out in business, people who do great exploits for the kingdom of God, and that you will become glorified in everything that we do, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand in this house. He's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. May God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Spend time with your family. Tomorrow's a holiday. And we hope to see you back next Sunday. May the Lord bless you. Please join us for coffee and tea directly after the service. God bless.